Thanks a lot, uh, thanks a lot uh, for all of us for the exercise. Now we are really extremely active to follow the third session. This third session will be moderated by Dr. Luis Zunio. I know you know Dr. Luis. He is president of the IULTCS this morning. He was there. Now he's passing to uh, Mr. Jean Pierre. Uh, he helped us a lot in this con Congress preparation. Uh, we are very grateful to him. Dr. Lees is, uh, other than being IULTCS president, he is also global uh, manager of Buckman, uh, innovation manager at Buckman, and he has more than 40 years, 43 years dedicated service to the laser industry. Uh, with due respect, uh, Dr. Lees, uh, I humbly request you to take the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. I think after this exercise, people are very energized. Uh, Dr. Campbell is going to help me today on the session. Welcome, everybody. <laughs> okay, so the, f the first presenter, and I have not seen the presenter here today. Is the presenter here? Uh, Mr. Mustafa. Mumu Glu, is he here? Tempo, have you seen him? I, I have not seen no, him. I, I just put the name in, in the participants and it's not, never it's not seen coming him. up. Yeah. Is there a, anybody else here from who might know from Dr. Luis, he, he's he, here in the hall. He's uh, physically present. He's ready. Ah, okay, okay. He's physically okay. there, Louis. Okay. Okay, the title of the, the paper Hello? is Fabrication of Epoxy Composite Material, a Novel Approach in Waste Management in Leather Industry. Uh, Mr. Mustafa, Moon Kuglu is from Turkey, is an experienced researcher in the field of leather engineering at Egypt University, Department of Leather Engineering. Welcome, Mr. Mustafa, to the presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, after the relaxing and I am ready to present this issue, my issue. Firstly, I want to present myself. I am from Turkey, Mr. Mustafa Mumjolu, and I want just two, three lines. I want to introduce myself and I worked 30 years in leather business in different uh, chemical companies and the tanneries. And then two years before I attended to Aggie University's Leather Engineering Department, and now I am a PhD SD student. Okay, thank you very much. Fabrication of epoxy leather sheet composite also, a novel approach in waste management in leather industry. As we know, solid waste of leather industry uh, which uh, generated very huge amount of solid waste in the tannery, in the sawn process, in beam house, in retaining agent, after the uh, shaving uh, process. And it can be classified vestes of tenet collagen, collagen, vestes of non tenet collagen, and other wastes. Under these uh, lines, they can be classified. In tannic industry, raw skins of hides are converted into leather by means of sequential chemical and mechanical operations, generating large amount of solid waste. This is also a very huge problem in the world. And uh, this moment, 
This solid waste can be classified as I showed you in figure one. Uh, out of 1,000 kg of raw height, nearly 745 kg generated as solid waste in leather processing, in different process of leather uh, process, only 200. 55 kg of raw material is converted in the usable leather, including splits. Typical tannery solid waste generated in tannery, such as flashing, this is 30 percentage, hair 2.5 percentage, chrome shaving, chrome splits and leather waste 20, 25 percentage, skin trimmings 10 percentage and buffing dust 1 percentage. Uh, improper disposal of this leather waste causes environmental pollution. Therefore, proper, proper optimized utilization of these wastes into valuable end products will be promising solution. Hence, in this study has been prepared leather waste fiber particles from chrome, shav chrome shaving waste. In recent years, a lot of research is focused on reinforcing thermoplastic and thermosetting polymers are used in various fields of automotive engineering, aerospace development, marine technology, construction industries, leather products, food fear components, electrical devices and electrical switches, etc. Epoxy resin is widely used thermosetting material reinforcement of epoxy resin with different types of fibers used for increasing mechanical properties. Why we choose epoxy? Epoxy has some uh, good properties and used in the different kinds of industries. I want to give some explanation that insulation is very important and high chemical resistance, high moisture resistance, strong adhesive, impact resistant, abrasion resistant, resistant to water, resistant to alkali, resistant to acids. Compared with other polymers have high molecular properties. Often used in industry, also prevents bacterial and fungal growth. After drying, it gains strong bonding features. Leather fiber, which is thermal insulative material, can act as a better reinforcing material when combined with epoxy resin. And this composite can be used for construction purposes. Epoxy polymers find wide application in terms of high modules and strength and good performance at elevated temperatures. Uh, normally, we know that in the <coughs> leather boards, <coughs> in the leatherboard production, there is uh, some problems on the strange problems. For this reason, uh, in this work, in this work, I decided to use a uh, epoxy, and I uh, tell the reasons and they are very good of the properties of epoxy. And the benefits of epoxy thermosetic polymer utilizing in composite. What makes it? Reducing environment pollution, cost effective, tensile strength, good tensile strength, when you compare with the other polymers, giving a good tensile poly strength. Lightweight, this lightweight is very important for the aeroplanes, aerospace components, also automotive sector. The consumption will be less. Uh, or the gasoline uh, fuel oil consumption will be less with the lightweight, lightweight components. And also hardness, it gives a very good hardness after drying, it gives a good mechanical uh, properties. Material method, 10 gram epoxy resin with hardener was taken to make 10 gram epoxy molliver was prepared, taken, chrome shaving fiber uh, below than five millimeter were taken and mixed using in a blender. Epoxy leather fiber particle composite mixture so prepared was cured in a hot air oven at 70 degree for three hours. Then 
the sample was taken, the dimension is eight and eight centimeter. Composite leather sheet were cut from the cured material. This composite was used for mechanical and morphological properties. In material method, as we see on the table, there were five material number and in all the materials were used epoxy polymer 10 gram. And chrome shaving fiber, in the first line you see one gram, then 1.5, two gram, 2.5, three gram. And gradually they increase the amount of chrome shaving fiber. And as you on the last uh, sign, you see the total polymer, total fiber. Also after three hours, 70 degrees uh, cured uh, sheets, the sample were taken and the uh, uh, SEM analyzes, uh, uh, it's for example, sorry, the, the samples were taken and then uh, it's prepared for the mechanical tests, mechanical testers, and for the SEM uh, results. And mechanical property of epoxy leather fiber were studied in the table. It is seen that uh, we will see in five uh, samples and the tensile strength, the number five is the best one, is the best one, and uh, the elongation is 10 is the best, and the thickness 2.52 millimeter were taken, and the tensile strength is the number five, because on material method we took the chrome shaving three gram, three gram in 10 gram epoxy polymer. Uh, results and discussion, SEM analyze uh, has been done uh, for the morphology. Uh, morphology surface was observed and the surface was very smooth and uh, in the uh, blending of the epoxy and fiber also uh, was uh, observed very tight and the smooth was very surface. Uh, smooth surface were very very smooth and for this uh, being the smooth surface and a later a later application will be more effective. Uh, before the conclusion, uh, I want to add some things in the the composite total total composite value in the world is approximately this year approximately its forecast is approximately 90 and nine, between 90 and 100 billion dollar and the general composite is the share of the general composite 60 and 70 billion dollar and the epoxy composite is around 35 35 billion dollar in two in 20 in 24 uh, three years after, forecast is approximately total composite market value is approximately 140, 150 billion dollar. And also epoxy composites are generally used for automotive sector, construction sector, wind turbine sector, electrical devices, fiber reinforced composites, uh, it is often used in the general uh, industries. Leather base acted as a better reinforcement material for epoxy resin to enhance, enhance their mechanical properties. The study production of cost-effective composite by conversion of base into weld and the decreasing the environmental pollution. The prepared composites with better mechanical properties which could have construction material due to have high hardness and tensile properties and also for automotive industry application. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mustafa. Um, Thank you very much. Here, uh, I think your title, uh, epoxy leather sheet, is not really appropriate because leather 
should not be made of out of ground substrate. The leather should be integral part of the animal skin or hide. Okay. Sorry, I don't understand. But sorry, could you again, please? Uh, I I didn't understand well. Sorry. No, no. Uh, it le leather. You cannot define this article as a leather material, because leather has to be from the animal skin or a hide or skin without grinding the moment you grind it is not leather anymore uh, no. the title of your work is epoxy composite material that's a proper title for your paper okay epoxy uh, just moment just moment i composite want to clarify material. i want to clarify a title i want to clarify sorry Fabrication of epoxy leather sheet. I mean that here epoxy leather sheets, uh, uh, novel approach in waste management because it leather leather business. We have a too much too much uh, huge amount of leather waste. What I mean here, I mean no, here no. chrome shaving fiber. In the world, in the world, there are ten thousand tons processed in a year. It means one thousand two hundred kg every year in the world west chrome shaving but i take here chrome fiber with epoxy in my study okay, no, I, understand, I understand sir is about the definition of leather okay so uh, th that's the point is the definition of leather your material cannot be defined as a leather if you decide that as composite material then it's okay 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 thank you okay okay yeah, it's simply the wording, yeah, just, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah agreed. Uh, thank you, Dr. Liz. Okay, thank you. Our next speaker is Dr. Nubi Kamini, and the topic is microbial degradation of animal hair and preparation of organic compost thereof. Dr. Kamini, is a senior principal scientist and head of the biochemistry and biotechnology at CSI, CSIR, Central Leather Research Institute. She's an honorary faculty of HANA University and associate professor. Her areas of specialization include microbial enzyme technology, molecular biology, biotechnology for waste utilization. Production of uh, alternate fuels and bioremediation. Dr. Kamini has 42 publications in peer review oh, journals, okay. is a winner of different awards, and holds membership in yes. different professional societies. So we welcome Dr. Kamini, please. Uh, am I audible? Yes, you're on. You're on. Yes. Yeah. Good evening. This is Dr. Kamini from Department of Biochemistry and Biotechnology, CSIR Central Leather Research Institute, Chennai, India. The title of my presentation is on microbial degradation of animal hair and preparation of organic compost thereof. Sorry, I'm not able to move the slide. You uh, should stop sharing so that I'll share it again. Okay. Mr. Chairman, can, can you put Dr. Kamini as a co-host? She's not showing up as a co-host. She can't share unless she's a co-host. I, I believe she was a co-host. She was, but now it's gone from the list. Well, I think she left. I think she left. She's reconnecting, probably. Okay, maybe we have to move the next presenter. Let's wait just a little bit and then we'll move on. 
and she can present on the end. Okay. Okay. So we'll go to the next speaker. Is uh, Dr. Sengoda Rajamani, and the topic is biological liquefaction and anaerobic digestion of waste yeah, flashings integrated with sludge and bioenergy generation, a novel and sustainable development. Dr. Rajamani is from India, is the chairman of the Asian International Union of Environment Commission. Welcome, Dr. Rajamani, for your presentation. Uh -huh. <laughs> Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Chairman, for your nice introduction. And I am pleased to see all of our uh, IVLTCS colleagues and the participants of a long time. So the, my topic is uh, the anaerobic digestion of the waste flushings and all the mixed with uh, solid waste, but sludge, and also the liquefaction of the flushings uh, using the enzymes generated from the anaerobic digestion. So this is the novel development. This development is done under Indo-Dutch cooperation, the TNO Institute of uh, Netherlands and CSAR, CLRA, and also UNIDO participated in this uh, lab scale, pilot scale, and commercial scale implementations. Now we are implementing a major uh, anaerobic digester and uh, Ganga action plan in Kanpur. So I will uh, go to the uh, presentation my PowerPoint presentation. Oh. Oh. My uh, co-author is uh, Mr. Arnold Muller, uh, formerly he was with the TNO of the Netherlands. We have developed this with our CLRA, CSIR colleagues, TNO colleagues, and also uh, UNIDO participated in this uh, South Asian program. Uh, it's a real uh, good development and in one of our recent presentation by Mr. Carl also, the European Union also encouraging the anaerobic digestion to reduce the volatile organic matter from the solid waste. To see uh, the rather process is about 17 million tons per year, but the waste discharge is 600 to 650 million. And it goes along with a large amount of salt. But the chromium management is done in many countries uh, chrome reduction, chrome free process. All this is the major problem is tannery solid waste, which is six to seven million tons uh, totally. And uh, in Asia itself, it's uh, nearly four million tons. The main problem is uh, disposal, same disposal of the flushings. The flushings earlier they were using for glue and gelatin. Now, a lot of synthetic materials have come. So they could not uh, dispose these flushings in a safe and uh, sustainable way. Sludge disposal also become a major problem. Even uh, dumping into the Asaras category, secured landfill, there are a lot of restrictions. You have to reduce the volatile organic matter from the sludge. So for that, uh, the new guidelines have come. Then in India, uh, the, the, the entire sludge from the tannery effluent plant CTPR, it is uh, characterized as hazardous waste. But the volatile organic content in the hazardous sludge is more than 20-25%, but it is being restricted. Uh, it should be less than 20% as far as in India is concerned. The Europe and all, they are restricting to less than 5%, some places like 10%. So there are two ways of uh, managing it. One is adding further uh, inorganic chemicals like lime and all. Then that will increase so that it will reduce the uh, organ, volatile organic content, but the total volume will increase. The cost will also increase. So the other way is to reduce the volatile organic uh, matter by segregation and anaerobic digestion. So this is the feasible option we have developed. Uh, during the past two, 10 years. The separation of the, the another uh, uh, innovative development is separation of the liquefaction phase, phase and the anaerobic digestion phase in the uh, anaerobic digestion. See, the first phase, liquefaction phase, first two, six to seven days is done 
mainly by enzymes. But in the next 20, 25 days, it is done, anaerobic digestion is done, methane producing bacteria by generation. But there won't be any water in the first phase, but the water start coming in the second phase. What we did is we separated the two activities in two different uh, reactors. So that is the main thing. And also we have used the residual biomass and enzymes in liquid coming from the anaerobic reactor uh, to uh, dissolve the uh, flushings. We biologically dissolve. We take the biologically uh, the flushings from the tanneries, collect the uh, waste biomass from the uh, reactor using adding a little more enzymes. But biologically it liquefies. There is no mechanical means. We don't mince it and uh, liquefies it and converted into a liquid. So this is the process flow diagram. We take the sludge uh, segregated sludge, but we also nowadays segregating the chrome stream. Uh, the soap stream with more organic contents and other composite stream. So we take the bio sludge, less no chromium or less chromium, and uh, take the flushings. The flushings are biologically liquefied and mixed into the feeding tank. So the liquefied flushings give a lot of COD and improves the biogas generation because a lot of fats and other things increase the COD to 25,000 to 30,000. It goes to the anaerobic reactor. The anaerobic reactor works 25 to 30 days and uh, gentle mixing and uh, it gives the biogas and the one part, uh, the supernatant. The supernatant means it's a biomass, liquefied biomass goes for the liquefaction. The digested sludge comes in the bottom. So this is an interesting part of the uh, biological liquefaction. We bring the uh, flushings from the tanneries, the waste flushings mostly scattered and all and we put it in different tanks we add the biomass the supernatant from the anaerobic reactor into different tanks we give gentle mixing under normal atmospheric conditions it loses the fiber the enzyme slowly loosen the fibers so in the up the end of seven to eight uh, ten days the it really becomes loosened the fiber it thick uh, yellow color biomass with fat and all it is collected in the bottom of the tanks. So we use different tanks for each day and uh, the end, the cycling process and the liquid is collected in a separate tank and along with the uh, bio sludge from the clarifier around 3 to 4 percent solid is pumped to the main reactor. So we developed two reactors, one first reactor uh, under uh, Inudo support. This is in the uh, Indo French corporations, the CTC also the experts mixture, Machalala, and all they were involved. And the, we uh, so feed the uh, biomass, liquefied flushing, as well as the sludge with the recirculation. And uh, within 25 to 30 days, the biogas is generated. The, then it is collected in the gas balloon. And the balloon uh, is taken to the uh, further to the gas engine, and gas engine generates the power. And the digested sludge again is taken for the further composting after the water. So this is the source of the feed, and you can have a clear idea of the volume and the liquefied flush is how much it is giving the COD. And uh, in the first reactor, the uh, semi-commercial reactor, we feed about 55 meter cube of sludge every day uh, in the mixed conditions. And it, uh, the COD is uh, around 1,900 kg and uh, uh, the, this gives uh, roughly 0.5 meter cube, 5 meter cube of uh, biogas per kg of COD removal. This is a conventionally uh, expected. The biogas generation is around 800 to 1,200 meter cube per day. It depends upon the quality of the feed and the temperature. And the biogas generation is currently used as a fuel for the boilers, burning and all. That is being separately taken to the uh, gas engines. Gas engines are made locally also. And converted into electrical energy. Either you can use it in the effluent treatment plant or you can give to the grid and collect the power anywhere. So the digested bio sludge is further dewatered and they take the miser content around 70 80%, solids concentration 20 to 25%. The further bio uh, fertilizers mixed with some more sludge also. So this is the composting process normally. 
uh, that is uh, uh, composted and it is done in for 10 to 15 days. It's become a uh, black moss. And uh, that process also, we made it simple. Next. So this is the one. We take the digested slides from the uh, anaerobic reactor, dewatering. And also we take some more uh, conventional slides and also we use some local organic waste, maybe leaves or flushing, uh, fl some, not flushing, mostly uh, the vegetable market waste, all these things, they are all mixed and they turn into these uh, reactors open, I think with covered stop to prevent any rainwater going to the system. And it is slowly uh, tilted and after 14 to 15 days, uh, it, it is taken and it is becomes as an equal solids. It is sorted out and pulverized and uh, packed and taken by uh, fertilizers. The conversion period is about 10 to 15 days. Here it is anaerobic mostly, not much. Initially, we have some anaerobic. Afterwards, it's become an anaerobic. So this is the uh, overall results in, from our study and the, the COD uh, is around, the, the mixed COD to the reactor is around the 2000 kg per day from the 55, 50 to 55 meter cube of decomposed uh, sludge along with the biological liquefied things. The biogas produced is uh, about 750 meter cube per day is collected into the balloon and every day we used to get an, an average of 1500 kilowatt energy per day. So this is the first phase we are doing it. Depending upon the performance, it is be, uh, going to be expanded to all the CTPs, those mostly processing from raw to semi finished or finished. Next. So this is finally what we want to do. One of the important new development is liquefying the flushings. The mincing, cutting and all, it takes a lot of energy and also a problem. So when you do it with the biologically liquid flushing, interestingly also we have done some other articles we have done if you are doing the uh, living process or uh, hair removal with the enzymes that flushings liquefies faster so that is also an added advantage for us in case of your process instead of using totally uh, sulfide to use some enzymes it also adds uh, our, uh, adds uh, the liquefaction process and faster and uh, no mechanical system is there, there, there is interestingly there is no order because not much studies were done on the enzymic activity and the waste flushings or digestion but interestingly there is no emission till the uh, end, uh, end of the uh, enzymic activity once it start the biological uh, activity bacterial activity of uh, bacteria generation it smells by the time it is fed into the anaerobic closed anaerobic reactor so now we are uh, using the pile, uh, uh, gas as the fuel for the boilers and other things. But simultaneously, we are planning to convert into electrical energy to using gases. Next. So the additional uh, an, an advantage for us is a unique development. There are two advantages. The conversion of the entire flushings into biofertilizer energy and the sludge. The sludge also when you segregate the biodegradable sludge and anaerobically digested, the volatile organic content in the hazardous category sludge reduces by 50%, 60%, depending upon the things. So we are able to meet the uh, new environmental requirements in disposing the sludge without chemical additions. Otherwise, it will become too costly and complicated. So it is being replicated in India. In the Netherlands also, the two units, the liquefaction and all the two canaries, they are doing it in the Netherlands. Let's go for uh, replication of many places, as uh, mentioned by Mr. Carl and the European Union and others also. They are encouraging the anaerobic digestion, reducing the volatile organic matter going to the landfill. So this is a uh, good thing. And uh, I would like to thank it with, with the efforts of many collaborators starting from the Indian Weather Technologies Association, Mr. Arnab Jha, IEL, ECS. Also, they got the opportunity to interact with all our international colleagues, get the feedback, UNIDO, and uh, the ALLPA, CLEA, China. They also done some anaerobic reactions. We learned a lot from that. So, Italy and all, they have given the feedback how their sludge 
the volatile organic content to be reduced in the slides. So like that, we need taken uh, support and guidance from the lessons learned from many uh, countries and uh, other things. And uh, the government of India now giving good support for the implementation of innovative diversions. I would like to thank the government of India, CSCR, CLRA, the leather complex, and the Netherlands uh, government, and the Dutch cooperation, and my colleague, uh, Arnold Mulder, who has done a lot of guidance because they have a lot of experience in the uh, anaerobic digestions of the organic matters. One minute. One minute. So, thank you so much uh, and uh, for this passionate listening. And I will be pleased to answer any questions at the end. Thank you, Chairman, for this opportunity. Thank you for the passionate listening. Thank you, Dr. Rajamani. It was a very interesting presentation. So let's now check if uh, Dr. Kamini can come in. Okay. Oh, wow. Very good. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Okay. Good evening, all. There was some connectivity problem. So the title of my presentation is on microbial degradation of animal hair and preparation of organic compost thereof. So in the leather manufacturing process, unhairing is one of the unit operations where hair is removed from the heights and skins. About 50 tons of hair waste is generated per annum during the processing of 1000 tons of heights and skins. This needs to be safely disposed because the hair waste is not biodegradable. The disposal of hair waste causes various environmental problems. Therefore, safe disposal of hair is essential. The global demand for chemical fertilizer and organic fertilizer is expected to increase at compound annual growth rate of 2.4 and 7.92% respectively. Globally, India is the second largest consumer of fertilizers. Fertilizer demand for India is 52 million tons per annum and to meet the demand, 15 million tons is being imported. This demand could be substituted through production of 25 kilotons of compost from 1 kilotons of harvest. This is an exemplary model of waste to wealth approach. So efficient degradation of hair is essential because the hair waste is rich in keratin, it is recalcitrant and its degradation is slow in nature. Even the common proteases that are available in the market such as pepsin, papain, they are not able to degrade the hair. The disposal by bird dumping, burial and incineration causes various environmental problems associated with air pollution and contamination of water resources. The degradation by physicochemical methods are energy intensive, economically not feasible, and there is possible destruction of essential amino acids. Microbial degradation is found to be an alternative method because the method is highly efficient, the organisms could be grown in simple medium, and there is possible recovery of valuable products like amino acids and peptides. Moreover, the hydrolysate could be used for various industrial applications. CSA or CLRA developed a bioprocess for degradation of animal hair using a novel bacterium called Brevibacterium luteolum, MTCC5982. This was isolated from the hair dump yard of Indical Tannery, Tamil Nadu. The organism was maintained on nutrient broth agar slants and pre inoculum of the organism was made in nutrient broth medium. For degradation of hair, basal salt medium was used. It contained simple salts of dibasic and monobasic salts of potassium phosphate, sodium chloride, and hair. This organism is unique because it is capable of utilizing hair alone as the sole source of carbon and nitrogen. Because the available organisms, whatever it's available in the literature, they require addition of carbon and nitrogen sources. These are the fermentation conditions. About 10% of the pre inoculum was used for scale-up studies in 7 liter, 75 liter, and 750 liter fermenter with working volume of 5 liter, 50 liter, and 500 liter medium. The organism was grown for 72 to 96 hours at 30 degrees centigrade. The fermentation results showed keratinase activity of 100 units per ml with productivity of 1.5 units per ml per hour and 1.65 units per ml per hour in 50 liter and 500 liter medium. The initial pH of the medium was increased from 7 to 
8.9 and 8.4 in 50 liter and 500 liter formulation medium. This slide shows about the structure and degradation of keratin. The structure changes of hair degradation was analyzed by SEM. The structure of hair is shown in at, uh, shown at zero hours. Hair has three cylindrical layers of cuticle, cortex, and medulla. The degradation of hair was initiated at 24 hours, and complete degradation of hair was observed at 72 hours with exposure of cortex and damaged medulla. The structural integrity of hair is mainly due to the disulfide bond in cystine, and during degradation, there is breakage of disulfide bond in cystine to form cystine. So whatever fermentation medium, fermentation liquor we uh, obtained from the fermenters were used for the preparation of compost. The process goes like this. The hair waste obtained from the tannery was cleaned with, wash, uh, washed with water and dried and used for the degradation studies using the keratinolytic bacterium that was identified. And the process was scaled up in 5 liter, 50 liter and 500 liter fermenter, fermentation medium. The fermentation liquor as it is without uh, disposing any biomass or supernatant it was mixed with the composting material comprising of soil, leaves, sawdust, and wheat bran, and they were mixed in ratio of 1 is to 1. That's 500 liter of fermentation liquor and 500 kilograms of composting material. They were mixed well in a ribbon mixer. And the mixer were transferred to composting pit, and the composting process was carried out for a period of 12 to 14 days. The moisture content was adjusted at 55%, and Throughout the process, carbon and nitrogen content were estimated. Once after attaining the accurate carbon nitrogen ratio, the process was completed. The product was taken, dried, and packaged. The final product was given to National Agro Foundation. It's a non government organization. We have given the product for testing, characterization, and field application studies. During the composting process, various parameters like pH, temperature, moisture content, or my, microbial population, organic carbon, and total nitrogen were estimated. The temperature was seemed to be increased from 33 to 40 during the initial period of composting, and thereafter it was decreased. The moisture content was maintained at 55. There was significant increase in microbial population from 10 power 4 to 10 power 6 at the end of composting. The carbon nitrogen ratio was initially 40, which decreased significantly at the later period. The compost prepared at 550 and 500 kilogram levels were analyzed for parameters like pH, conductivity, moisture, total nitrogen, total phosphate, potassium, organic carbon, and carbon nitrogen ratio, and compared with the fertilizer control for their acceptable limits. The results were found to be comparable with the fertilizer control Hence, further taken up for field application studies. Application of compost in paddy crop was carried out at Sirinagar village in Kanchipuram district, Tamil Nadu, India. The prepared compost was evaluated in the field level. Before uh, The compost was sprinkled in the soil before plowing, followed by transplantation of seedlings. The crops were analyzed for various, property, various properties and the yield of crop was 20% which was higher than with the control. Similarly, the compost was applied in chili crop. The crop of chili, uh, compost was applied in Malampudi village, which is one of the drought areas in Ramnathapuram district, Tamil Nadu. The chili seedlings were sown in the field after application of compost. There was significant increase in product yield by 20% with controlled growth of yields. Apart from paddy and chili, the product was applied in various horticultural crops like amaranthus and pendi. The increase in yield of the product was more than 30%. The compost was produced in bulk and given to some of the startup companies for field application trials in bell pepper and cardamom crops. The results showed enhanced yield. Therefore, the compost application could also be broadened to various economically important crops. An awareness program was organized for demonstration of the CSAR CLRA technology to the farmers at Tiruvallur district and Ramnathapuram district, Tamil Nadu. With this uh, was sponsored by a public sector company with CSR funds, that is Corporate Social Responsibility Funds. Under this program, the importance of organic farming 
and their benefits in sustainable agricultural practicing were explained to the farmers. Added benefits to the farmers. Apart from significant increase in crop yield of 20 to 30 percent, there was significant control in the growth of weeds and reduction in the usage of chemical fertilizer to one third. There was significant enhancement in the growth of blue green algae in paddy crop, which prevented the water evaporation. The after effect of the compost was very good for the subsequent crop growth, and there was improved properties. That is, the shelf life and quality of the product found to be very good. Highlights of the process. The preparation of organic compost technology has led to development of two more technologies. One on preparation of keratin hydrolysate from feather base. This was filed as an Indian patent application in 2018. And another process was on manufacture of organic supplement from animal hair waste through biochemical method. Recently, this process was licensed to Dindical Tannery Association, Talco. This, in addition to this, it's a zero waste discharge process since the full fermentation liquor is utilized in the preparation of compost, that is, in, uh, no waste is discharged in the environment. The process provides sustainable solution for the disposal of hair waste. It's an exemplary model for circular economy as it provides scope for financial re returns. That is, the waste of tanning industry serves as an organic fertilizer for agricultural industry. The following facilities are available in CLRI towards production of various enzymes and products like compost at 500 liter and 500 kg levels. Apart from the compost product, the keratin hydrolysate could also be formulated in, into powder form through spray dryer or as liquid form formulation using evaporator. Our institute is providing services to various industries, tannery association and startup companies for demonstration of technologies and production of various enzymes for pre tanning applications. Thank you all. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kevin, for the interesting uh, application of the uh, animal hairs. Very good. Thank you. So, sir. Now we have our, our, the last speaker of the day is Dr. Wolfram Schultz. I think he is on the on is on site, right? Good afternoon, everybody. Just a second. Just a second. I have to finish your introduction. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Uh, the topic of uh, Dr. Schultz is uh, the key technologies for tannery wastewater treatment. Dr. Schultz is from Austria and is the chairman of Environmental Commission IUE of the IULTCS. He is coordinating the dissemination of new environmental developments in each country. R&D activities, leg legislation, and eco-label developments. He is fellow member of the SLTC, the UK Society of Leather Technologists and Chemists. Welcome, Dr. Schultz. Thank you very much, Luis. Uh, good, good afternoon, everybody. Yeah, I'm very pleased to be here today and to meet a lot of colleagues and also congratulations for this first uh, hybrid conference. Good, I would like to give you an overview. I'm the chairman of the IUE Commission and uh, we, the IUE Commission is a, one of the five commissions of the IULTCS and we have rep representations from uh, over 30 countries. We meet regularly in one of the member countries and interact on environmental issues and uh, tackle technical, find technical solutions to tackle the pollution problems in tanneries. Uh, we have issued 12 environmental documents, uh, which I would like to encourage you to visit on the IULTC webpage, IULTC.org, uh, which are from recommendations on cleaner technologies uh, to solid and byproduct utilization, recommendations on Chrome 3 uh, containing waste, uh, till typical performance of effluent treatment plants around the world, 
and very important too, the typically pollution values which are related to conventional processing. Uh, order control, recommendations on order, which order which is very important. And uh, last but not least, also the guidelines for restricted products. Uh, one of the uh, rec most recent documents are the guidelines on minimum environmental standards. Uh, recently, we also have uh, uploaded the Tenue Effluent videos, and my presentation would like to give you, here would like to give you a short introduction about these videos explaining uh, key environmental technologies for tenue wastewater. Good. Tenue wastewater is very complex and requires a pretreatment. It's very different to treat tenue wastewater than municipal wastewater. And uh, we have, as a first step, the pretreatments to remove coarse solids and then the part stream treatment to, re to remove sulfides and chrome. For that reason, every tenue needs to segregate the effluents and to fine screen. Further, common practice is sulfur oxidation and chrome separation. And this follows afterwards the primary treatment uh, which, in which uh, suspended solids are removed. All the effluents after treatment are mixed in a balancing stage, neutralized, and then undergo a, a primary treatment using nowadays dissolved air flotation. Uh, here we remove all the solid waste, so suspended solids, but we still have soluble pollution in the form of COD, BOD, and nitrogen, which can be removed efficiently in biological treatments. And nowadays, best available technology are membrane bioreactor treatments. And in many cases, also water recycling is required or a final treatment to remove salts, a tertiary treatment uh, where nanofiltration or reverse osmosis is applied. So I would like to show you uh, one of the first steps, uh, which is practically the fine screening. Uh, this is important. Uh, as we said, we have to segregate chrome-bearing effluents. Uh, this can be from tanning and sanding, effluents containing sulfides from liming, wash, washes and flashes, and then the general effluents from soak, de-lime, re-tanning and finishing, if we look at all the processes from raw uh, to finished leather. And here we apply fine screening to retain the coarse solids that obviously protects the subsequent treatment steps and uh, also eliminates particles to avoid damages and blockages of pumps and pipes. You can see a photo of a fine screen. It takes a little time, sorry. Photo of a uh, fine screen. Uh, the common best practice nowadays is to screen down to one millimeter. And uh, here I would like to show you the first uh, tenue effluent video which is uh, actually the w wastewaters are collected in a sump and then fine screened with the automatic fine screen which cleans itself by the movement and all particles and fibers are removed which are larger than one millimeter. It's a very good pretreatment also to remove uh, partly chrome which is attached to fibers. The following treatment essential for every tannery which does uh, beam house processes uh, is the sulfur oxidation. We've heard today already that uh, new technologies evolving uh, to have sulfide-free systems which actually would replace such a sulfur oxidation. But many tanneries are using sulfur oxidations because they use sulfides and lime uh, for the unhairing and that involves aeration of collection and aeration of the sulfate liquors for six hours in batch. We need a lot of air to uh, oxidize all the sulfides. We need two kilos oxygen per kilogram of sulfides, which we have, a, we need a good oxygen transfer to aerate and to oxidize the sulfates. This is very important to reduce the smells of the tannery, especially of the effluent treatment during balancing where the pH usually drops when we add uh, uh, retanning or tanning liquors. Uh, then further, it's very important to reduce sulfides to reduce the toxicity of the effluent during biological treatment. 
and we can achieve with nowadays technology less than one ppm. Another advantage is that also we can reduce the COD uh, with the sulfate oxidation from 50,000 down to even, in the best case, 17,000 milligrams per liter. This is here are uh, photos of blowers, use, uh, a blower which is used to supply the oxygen and a recirculation pump. And uh, here I would like to show you a photo of oxidized sulfate liquors which also change slightly the color and they get brownish. But here I would like to show you the animation to explain how it works. So the sulfate oxidation plant comprises of two tanks, which are initially empty, and a blower on the top, in between the tanks, and a recirculation pump on the left and right side, you can see, and uh, jet oxygen tourists. So the effluent from liming containing sulfides is uh, transferred to a tank, the oxidation tank is filled up, and then uh, the recirculation starts and the aeration and oxygen is transferred to the tank, into the tank to uh, oxidize all the sulfides to sulfates. And of course we have two systems which are working in alteration, so that uh, guarantees the flexibility of processing and discharging lime liquors of, from the tannery. So the next, the next step is uh, the chrome recovery. Uh, chrome liquors have to be segregated, which is very important. And uh, to, to uh, remove the chrome in the most concentrated form from the effluent, this is being done exactly in the same way by, uh, by eliminating all the fibers with the fine screen. Then the chrome liquors are transferred to a precipitation tank. Uh, the pH is adjusted to pH 9, there's a certain reaction time, and then we achieve the chrome hydroxide sludge, which can be pressed off in the filter press. The supernatant, or the filter press uh, permeate, is chrome-free, and the chrome is concentrated in the chrome filter cake. And this gives us also the opportunity to recycle the chrome. There are regeneration processes for chrome, where sulfuric acid and steam is used uh, to, to regenerate the chrome in this most concentrated form. In some cases, filter adds are added to remove proteins and fibers. And uh, then there's another step to fit again with the filter press and to retain impurities. And then we have actually chrome, which is ready for recycling. But uh, of course, the basicity has to be adjusted and assessed, and the chrome content has to be measured. So then the liquors are stored and uh, the regenerated uh, liquors and can be and are ready for reuse. Good here, uh, this is a photo of the chrome cake in the filter press. This is the most concentrated form of chrome. In the following, when we have done this part stream treatments and we have uh, actually uh, dealt with uh, chrome and sulfides and uh, treated these two streams, propanetic streams, uh, we, can, we can add all the effluents in a balancing tank. Here we can mix the soak, delime, retaining and finishing effluents together with the treated effluents from these two part streams. And why do we need balancing? We have many, many different streams. Uh, of different concentrations, different pollution rates, and different pages. And uh, the balancing stage, balancing is important to achieve a minimization of variation in strength and composition, to neutralize alkaline and acidic process streams, and to improve the performance of downstream processes. This can allow us, of course, also to reduce the size and costs of all the following treatments. Here I would like to show you a photo of a very modern, very efficient balancing system uh, which uh, comprises of uh, jet oxygen tourists and the recirculation pump. And here the effluent has a holding time of about one day where it's continuously mixed, aerated, 
and residual sulfides are still oxidized, so here we can avoid smells. And for practicality, we uh, use normally recirculation pumps which are dry mounted, so they can be easily maintained. How does it look in action? So this is a balancing tank where all is mixed and aerated, and you can see not no big air bubbles on the surface, but a very, very good mixing and aeration of uh, the balanced effluents. So how does this work? Uh, here you can see exactly what you saw before in the photo in an animation. Balancing tank usually is full and uh, the screened tannery effluents are collected in the balancing tank. Then we have a recirculation pump where the effluents are recirculated and pumped through the jet toxin tools. Air is sucked in, so here we don't require a blower, so it's very energy efficient, this mixing and aeration system, because we don't need uh, a blower energy additional. And uh, you can see that fine bubbles are uh, evolving, and uh, the main advantage here is that uh, we don't need any maintenance for the tank, because no solids can settle. The next part of the treatment is the primary treatment. Here we remove mainly suspended solids, but also colloidal substances. And this can be done with a physical chemical separation by settlement or flotation. Uh, Coagulants and flocculants are here used to increase the elimination of colloidal substances and solids and to support the flock formation. Because as soon as we have a flock, a flock is heavier and sinks down to the ground quicker and can be then uh, clarified and uh, removed. Uh, typically, uh, here we use coagulants like aluminum sulfate, but it's also possible to use ferric chloride and a flocculant, a contra polymer, anionic polymer to achieve a larger flock size and a better clarification. And then we have the separation with either settlement or flotation. So how does this look like? Yeah, here we have, actually nowadays mainly we use a piece of air flotation, uh, which is exactly the opposite of the sedimentation. Here we float all colloidal substances, but also here we can remove fats and oils as well as uh, surfactants, which is a big advantage. For that reason, the performance of uh, these of the flotation systems is much better. And the effluent is conditioned with, minutes, the please. Minutes, please. Yep. with the coagulant <laughs> and the flocculant. And then the air is introduced at high pressure into the effluent, generating small air bubbles. So I would like to show you also the animation of the dissolved air flotation. Uh, you can see here that the balanced effluent is pumped to a flocculator. And here at this flocculator, we can mix uh, chemicals, coagulants and flocculants, aluminum sulfate and polymer. And uh, the original suspension of very, very small particles increases in flock size with the addition of chemicals. And we achieve a larger flock which can be separated in the dissolved air flotation system. Uh, the dissolved air flotation comprises of a pressurized recycled water and air uh, tube, which produces small bubbles which lift suspended solids to the surface. And these solids can be afterwards removed as a dense sludge, much denser than the sludge of settlement and can be pressed off in a filter press or in a centrifuge. The effluent after dissolved air flotation is well clarified. Okay, I will show the next one because I have to be a little bit quicker, I've just heard. Uh, so dissolved air flotation looks like that. Uh, you can see here on the right the discharge, which is completely clarified transparent effluent and uh, the dissolved air flotation system, which is a stainless steel tank, able to remove 98% of the solids. So you can see here on the right side, we can achieve a completely clarified, uh, clean effluent with almost no suspended solids and a very dense sludge. Some sediments, sand, 
earth which settle are removed at the bottom of uh, this fully automated dissolved air flotation system. But okay, now we have removed all soluble pollution and we still have all, all uh, suspended solids, but we still have remaining soluble pollution, uh, which is in the form of nitrogen, phosphate, but mainly degradable COD and BOD. And for here, we use a biological treatment, uh, a activated sludge treatment to remove uh, with microorganisms the sludge. Uh, to remove all the compounds and convert in CO2 and surplus sludge. So I would like to show you how this looks like. Here we have a denitrification system on the left, an aerobic nitrification system on the right, and in a denitrification we can remove uh, completely uh, uh, nitrates which are formed in the aerobic system on the right uh, during the uh, biological treatment. We'll go quickly through because I wanted to show you exactly also again the uh, animation. So here we use fine bubble aeration actually to efficiently aerate uh, the biological treatment. This consumes a lot of energy so we try to use the most energy efficient uh, treatments like here vertical diffusers for the biological system. But nowadays there are very high advanced biological systems, modern systems like membrane bioreactor, where actually the secondary clarifier is replaced by membrane filtration to retain suspended solids in the, in the biological system. So we have a longer retention time and we also can degrade problematic uh, recalcitrant substances, recalcitrant COD, which are normally very difficult to degrade. What we achieve is a reliable, excellent treated effluent treatment quality and uh, a main advantage is also the plant size reduces a lot. We have to aerate much less because we need a two-thirds less of biologically aerated uh, treatment which reduces the energy consumption about 50%. Energy nowadays is a very important factor looking at carbon footprints and uh, we can also reduce the minimum, uh, we can reduce the excess sludge generation. Usually in conventional treatments that's around up to 50% of all the BOD degraded ends up in surplus sludge. Here we have 10 times less. And uh, as these uh, MBRs, membrane barrectors, are very efficient, we can uh, actually improve the performance with, um, we have achieved, achieved uh, improved performance to reduce ammonia to less than 2 milligrams per liter and to reduce COD down to 90, uh, up to 95% and BOD to 98% compared to conventional systems, where biological systems, where we talk about 88%. Just please, uh, one more minute, okay? One more minute, yeah. Thank you. Good. I will quickly flip through the presentation. So here you can see uh, the permit quality after membrane barrector treatment. Uh, there's another animation, which I really wanted to show you, but you also can visit it on the IUTC. IUE web page about membrane barrector treatments, which explains the biological treatment in detail. But nevertheless, afterwards we also can, uh, after such uh, high quality membrane barrector treatment, it's possible to use nanofiltration for water recycling, uh, which has advantages regarding in, compar in comparison with uh, reverse osmosis, as with nanofiltration we don't retain sodium chloride. So all bivalent ions are retained and we achieve actually a recycled effluent quality, high quality water without concentrating up sodium chloride. Uh, here we have a picture of a, a industrial scale nanofiltration plant which uh, was installed about 12 years ago in France and uh, the result is a pyramid which has less than one milli Siemens and uh, actually it was possible here to improve the quality of discharge and to meet a very strict river discharge norm in this area in France of 125 milligrams per liter COD. And just to conclude I would like to show one more animation about nanofiltration or reverse osmosis 
And um, actually, a nanofiltration plant looks like that. We have a eff effluent being fed from uh, the membrane bioreactor treatment. And we go first through a cartridge filter and then afterwards with a high pressure pump, but here only at eight bars, uh, the water, the effluent is recirculated through the membranes, uh, which are installed in series. And uh, here we are using much less pressure, so here eight to 12 bars, compared to reverse osmosis where pressure has to go up to, up to 50, 50 bars depending on the salt concentration. And we achieve a very clean permeate, which can be afterwards treated, uh, tr uh, which can be afterwards uh, transferred for water recycling. I only wanted to show how such a nanofiltration model looks from inside. Uh, it's a little bit like a French roll. <coughs> and uh, you can see here uh, layers of membranes and a spacer. The effluent is pumped along the membrane surface uh, through the spacer and the water is collected, the permeate, the clean water is collected on the permeate side of uh, the membranes. So now I would like to come to the conclusions. Maybe I have still 20 seconds. <laughs> so uh, to conclude, uh, please visit the uh, IOE webpage and look at the uh, effluent videos, but all in all what we presented here were fine screening to remove coarse particles are important. Tenoe's best developed technology now have sulfur oxidations where we can remove sulfides to less than one milligram per liter. Uh, chrome recoveries reduce chrome to less than one milligram per liter. The advisable treatment nowadays for primary treatment is this of their flotation, tough treatment to remove also micropollutants and recalcitrant COD, achieving effluents with less than 50 milligrams per liter suspended solids. It's a full automated plant. Uh, then further the biological treatment can achieve with the MBR uh, up to 92% COD removal and BOD of less than 20 milligrams per liter. And nanofiltration can provide up to 80% water recycling. So all these measures of key technologies for wastewater treatment achieve local standards, but also currently getting stricter and stricter international standards like Leather Working Group and Zero Discharge of Hazardous Substances, uh, CDHC compliance. I thank you very much for your attention and uh, I'm open afterwards in the question and answer uh, sessions. Thank you, Dr. Schultz. Uh, uh, I think it's important that we thank you for sharing these videos with IOTCS, because I think it's one of the best informations we have on wastewater, and everybody has access to this information. So I really appreciate that. So now we have questions. Um, Dr. Campbell, would you like to, to moderate those questions? Yes, just, uh, where am I, to come back in. Yeah, okay, <laughs> now I'm back in. I was just looking at the questions. Um, can, there is a number of questions already come in. Um, I, can I ask that they be put up, uh, on the screen like we had before? That's Campbell, I, I think you have to choose, you have to go and choose the questions. Approve the question, um, who is going to show up? Yeah. Yeah. yeah answer now, answer now. No, yeah. I think here, this is okay. Yeah. They, they're doing this here. Um, I think you have to go right down towards the bottom because the whole list is quite a long bunch of questions from earlier today. Session three, yeah. 
Okay. Okay, there is, yes, doctor, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, can you bring that one up? Dr. Kamini, there are several questions come up for you. Um, I leave you to answer. Yeah, I do, yeah. Please comment on that. Yeah, you are right, uh, Mayor. It could be used as very well as a fertilizer. Okay. So, Dr. Kamini is agreeing with what your question, Michael. So, we now go to the next question. Do you please comment on how you measure the keratinase during the desert purple? Actually, we will be estimating the keratinase activity using angiocasin as substrate. Uh, sorry, I didn't. I didn't understand. Using a. We'll be using doing the keratinase activity using angiocasin as substrate. So the mechanism behind it. During degradation, keratinase enzyme will be produced and that keratinase will break the disulfide bond which is present in the hand. Okay. Okay, thank you. Yeah. We go to the next question. Immunization of hair with lime. It's immunization or? Yeah, this is from. Um, Harvey, Emmanuel Harvey. Harvey. Yeah, he probably can't communicate. With, can you turn Mr. Harvey? Can you unmute? Session of her or see yes. actually some enzymes, proteases, they could act as keratinase also. So together we can do unhiring and then hair degradation as a single process also. But I am not getting what he has written, that word immunization of her. Yeah, I'm not. Can you can you come in? Maybe you can't unmute. Yes, now you can speak, Mr. Harvey. I, I, we show uh, ZSP system where we we make immunization of uh, hair, and uh, with my experience, uh, when uh, I cannot succeed to. Uh, an air all the air in ZSP, uh, addition of keratinase or some sulfite cannot affect the, the air. My question is, is, uh, is uh, the system uh, show uh, by uh, Dr. Kamini can, uh, can have uh, good success with uh, air immunization with the light? Actually, hair saving method is entirely different. During uh, whatever hair we obtain after the unhairing process, it could be converted into compost using the microbial process. Nice to hear. Okay, thank you. We try the next question. Actually, this 
depends on the quantity of compost what we are going to make. If the quantity of compost is one ton, then it depends on the pit size, how many pits we are going to make. There are so many parameters involved. For example, for preparation of 500 kilogram of compost, we used around uh, 1,200 square feet of area. Oh, that's half ground. Okay. Okay. 1,200 square feet, was that 10 square meters or something, yeah? Yes. Okay. Can I answer, Dominic? Uh, uh, oh, yes, sir. Yes. Actually, for the composting, it's uh, as she has mentioned, depending upon the uh, characteristics, uh, volatile organic matter and all. Then uh, normally for one ton process, we require about 15 meters to be open. 15 meters square. That means 1,500 square foot or 15 uh, meters square. And I, it's it not uh, much, maybe maximum 200, sorry, 20, 25 meters square only. Because the retention time is uh, about 15 days, 14 to 15 days. So one ton, maybe map height, you can take it to one meter height maximum or 50 to 60. So 20, 25 uh, meters square per ton of compost processing you require. So if you are processing 10 tons, you may require say about 200 to 15 meters square. So it's not much. But, uh, okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Rajman. Okay. That question we can close. Are there any more questions to ask? Sorry, I got myself muted. Okay, now I think I'm open. Are there any more questions to answer? So there is some question from Saravan Saravanan. I think we've answered all of the questions which have been sent in. Just a quick response. Oh, he's speaking now. Uh, yes. Wait a minute. Uh, uh, Campbell, he, he's all, he's live. He, he's a yes. he's live. Yes. Uh, may, may I? Yes. Yes, please. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it is just to supplement the question uh, connected to the immunization of the hair. Uh, uh, even the immunized hair can be degraded by the organism luteolum. That's what we have found. The organism is robust enough to disintegrate the immunized have to. That's my response. Therefore, the immunization does not impact the process of degradation of the hair negatively. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for your comments. Uh, very good to hear that. Okay, I think we have answered all the questions that were sent in and I think in that case do you, do you want to close the session out Lewis or no, I would like to thank you very much Campbell for the help and I think we should leave to the professor to to close the day he deserves okay. to close the day <laughs> Yeah, I, I've been uh, impressed. We've had a large number of online people listening the whole day. And I saw Lewis was doing the exercises before. So uh, that, that was very good. It must be about uh, two o'clock or three o'clock in the morning where you are, Lewis. Um, but uh, it's, uh, yes. Okay. Um, Professor McConian. Can we hand uh, the session back to you now? We have completed session Thank three you. successfully. And Thank I hand it back to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rees. And <clears throat> Thank you all, uh, Dr. Campbell Page, Dr. Rees, and also all the colleagues. Well done. Yes, thank you, thank you very much for all the, for the, to our moderators, uh, 
the IU LTCS uh, Secretariat here. So, thank you also for all the presenters, uh, the participants. Uh, thank you, really, it was a relatively long day, but you actively participated. We are very much grateful. Uh, we are concluding our uh, first day session with this. We acknowledge also our sponsors at this last minute. Uh, uh, I hope uh, they will be displayed on our, our screen. Uh, we wish you a very nice evening. Tomorrow morning we will meet. Obviously our session will start at 9. Thank you very much.